reading will be from Revelations chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must take place, must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads this, reads, and those who hear the words of prophecy and heed the things which were written in it, for the time is near. Ever watch one of those programs that deals with the book of Revelation? I'm not going to call you down if you've watched it. I have. I'll, I'll start the trend here. I have. And uh, when you see the program start, you see gloomy pictures. Dante's Inferno, right? Somebody losing their head, somebody doing this, and the music starts. Ugh. Oh no, it's the book of Revelation. Everybody run. Don't run. Don't run. I'm here to tell you this morning, and I believe you already know this, that there's no need in running from the book of Revelation or Genesis or Exodus or Lamentations or anything else, but especially not the book of Revelation. We get scared. Sometimes people do. I say we collectively, not us necessarily. But sometimes people are frightened by the imagery in there. And it is vivid. It is. But it has a point. And we're going to look today, and I have uh, planned three more sermons, but I was reading through the book again last night, and uh, I saw a couple more we may have to squeeze in. It's the preacher in me, you know what? You know how we are. We just can't stop. But uh, I'm going to try to not uh, just beat us about the head and shoulders, but I want to hit the high points of this book. And we're not going to study every nuance of it. That would be for a Bible class setting sometime. But what I want to do is look at a good overview today of, of, of the book and then the beginnings. And quite literally, it's a preparation for war. Actually, it's a preparation for war they and really we are already in. In warfare. We're in spiritual warfare. And the folks of the first century in the context of this book were in a, a warfare for their very lives and for their souls. Next week we'll look at the seven churches of Asia. Those folks were in need of restoration. And we'll talk about those things more next week. But I want to think about this this morning with this first in this series on the book of Revelation. I want to think about this. Some things that we see as this book begins, and it's, the, it's really almost the first word, it's where we, where we get the title, Revelation. The word literally means to reveal, it's in the very word itself. It means to lay bare, to open. Uh, sometimes it can be translated as naked. That is, all things are exposed. And what we're seeing, notice in verse number 1, God says, I'm laying bare all these things for you to see. I've heard folks say that, uh, well, the book is just, the book of Revelation is just so dark and hard to see. First verse says we can see right off the bat that it's clear God wants us to understand what's going on. He wants to see this. The, the word literally from the Greek language, we, which converts right over into the English, as apocalypse. Now, what do you think of when you hear that word apocalypse today? That's kind of how it's said, right? Devastation. Earth is scorched. People are dead. You know what it means? It means to lay bare to reveal. It has nothing to do the way people talk about. What we're looking at in the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Zechariah, Matthew 24, other passages in the Bible, are written in what is known as apocalyptic language. That is a revealing language that's, that, that puts things right out there in very vivid detail that we can have a standing, clear picture of what's going on. Thus, the idea that he uses here, the second point is signs. Uh, I noticed, I guess, um, I know the, the New American Standard Bible I looked at several this week, and uh, it uses the word communicated, and I don't like that, because the word, the Greek word there is signs, or signify, the old King James uses. That is, he tells us how he's going to reveal his message by signs. 
He's going to give it in pictures, in word pictures, and, and sometimes uh, graphic pictures. But that's how it's going to be revealed to us. If you were to see, we're coming up, we're in the silly season, right? I mean the political season, not the Christmas season, right? And you're going, we're going to start seeing a lot of commercials. I guess we already are probably. If I watch much TV, I'd know that. Banners, flyers, you name it. Now, if you see a political satirist, cartoonist, and you open up the newspaper and you see a donkey on one end and you see an elephant on the other side and they're pulling on a rope and you've got the United States right in the middle, what does that signify to you? Somebody's farm gone awry? Maybe the end of the world. Could be when politicians get involved, right? Not so. The Lord's going to take care of that. But it signifies a struggle between the Democratic and the Republican Party. Wouldn't you agree? I made that up, by the way. Believe it or not, I made that up. I couldn't draw it. <laughs> I can assure you, I couldn't draw it up. Someone else would have to do that. But we understand that is symbols. That is signs. And it's signs that we see often. There are signs coming in on, well, I guess it's six over here, from 93 to 6, that you'll see there. And they've got, I guess it's elk on there. Does that mean you need to stop and take a picture? It means you all heed the other signs that says watch for wildlife coming across here, right? So we understand signs. That's exactly what the word means in the New Testament. Something that's pointing me and giving me a direction. And by means of signs, God, through Jesus, through John, who's the human penman here, is giving us signs to help us understand, help in particular the first century audience, that's number one we have to remember, help them understand things, but also to point them to in a direction that they can understand. And we have to look at those signs and understand hopefully the very point of this book and understand what's going on. I mean, you look at, in Revelation you have uh, numbers used a lot. Seven is used, count it, 55 times in the book of Revelation. 11 in the first chapter alone. Seven means in ancient history and even in our modern setting, we still understand it of, uh, we call it perfection, more of a completion, might be a more accurate term. A completion of things. When we see the seven spirits of God before the throne of, the throne of God, it's a completion. It's deity. Verses 4 and 5 of the first chapter tell us that. We have God in heaven and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We have all three there. And there's pictured as the seven. The seven lampstands or the seven candlesticks the seven churches of Asia, and on and on and on we go. A perfection, a complete number, the seven seals that are opened by Jesus Christ. We see the, those signs giving to us and pointing to us. When I see the seven, there's a completeness there. There's something whole, a perfection, if you will, of he who is dead and is now living, verse 18 of chapter 1, in particular, the perfection of, the completion of God's will. And we understand that. We understand these signs and they're pointing us, folks, as we start looking through the book and looking through the book and looking through the book. He tells us what to expect. I have a couple of passages up there for you. Uh, Ezekiel 1, Daniel 7, uh, Daniel 8, uh, in particular, of where they had visions. Same thing here. When you get to chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, John says, look, I beheld in heaven, and I, I heard a voice from heaven saying, come up here. I will show you these things that must come to pass. I want to show you this in visions, John, and you're going to relay it to the people. And you're going to give it to them by means of signs. You know, they make things sometimes simplified, and sometimes the signs make things stick more. They stick into our minds, thus God's using them here. And you think about the last part of this prologue here. The faithful servants, the Christians, faithful children of God. That's his audience. He wants the church, the seven churches of Asia and the church of all time, really. Remember that's seven, right? The completion, the complete church. He wants us to understand about these signs, about what's going on, about what's taking place. We'll look at some context, historical context in just a moment. What's happening with the church of the end, at the end of the first century. How they're having to deal, what's going on, to give them comfort, to give them assurance, to give them a vision of the future. And it's not that distant future because think about this for a moment. One thing we need to look at here is this. 
when you read in chapter 1 there, in verse 1, and again in verse 3. Now remember, he is setting the uh, tone of the rest of the book for us. It's a revelation. It's a laying bare of God's revealed message. It is by Jesus Christ through his servant John. It is to the servants of God. It's by way of signs. But he says in verse 1 and verse 3, these things are, sometimes it's translated shortly come to pass, about to happen, quite literally. They're about to, about to take place. If I look at, there are other times where these same, that same word or same phrase is used in the New Testament. These two stand out. Paul said, I will come shortly to you. Now, I say that because of this. There are folks who look at the book of Revelation and they'll say, well, all these things are still future. Nothing's going to happen right now. These still are way out in the future. He's talking about things that are going to happen in the end of the world. When Antichrist is going to rise and all the things that people come up with. But wait just a moment, folks. Well, I'm going to introduce you to a word right now. And we're going to study it more this summer. It's called hermeneutics. Don't you love it? It's just got a ring to it, right? Uh, hermeneutics is, is uh, the, the principles of study, of understanding. Uh, biblical hermeneutics is understanding the Bible. All right, basically what it is. It's the science of interpretation is really what it is. And when you look at this, and we, have our, we put, our, we put our, our thinking on, as my mom used to say, and we start looking at the Bible, look at what it tells us in the first three verses. That's why I had them read this morning. It gives us not just a prologue, not the before words, what's going on, but all the words are going to take place. How to look at the rest of the book. He said in verses 1 and 3, these things are about to happen. Did he mean that? Did he mean they're about to happen to that first century church? Then why do folks say, no, that means way, way out in the future, 2,000 years or so later? They're going to happen. Why would people say that when Jesus Christ gives us the context of the book? When Paul said, I will come to you shortly there in 1 Corinthians 4.19, did he mean in a couple of millennia? No. When uh, Jesus tells them to quickly go out into the streets there in Luke chapter 14, did he, said, did he mean in a couple of millennia when you get time? When all things are ready, when Antichrist, when all these things that people yammer on about. You know what he meant? Go out now. When he said, I will come to you shortly, he means in a very short period of time. Days to weeks probably at the most. When Jesus said these things are about to happen or about to come to pass, you know what he meant? What we're about to read for the next 22 chapters were just about to happen at the close of the first century. Now, there's no way around it, folks. That's what the Bible, that's how the Bible describes what we're about to see. And we're going to look at that. We're going to delve more deeply into that later on, too, as well. And even in the book itself, there are four instances there. Four that say specifically these things. Matter of fact, he says in chapter 22 and verse 10, near the end of the book, Seal not up, don't seal up the, the prophecies of this book that are contained in this book. Why, John? Because they are near. Oh, I got you. Somewhere in the 2000s. Got you. I'll make a note of that somewhere. That 2,000 years from now. In other words, the church of the first century got nothing out of this book. If we were to take that viewpoint, folks. If we were to take the viewpoint that these things were somewhere way in the future, you know, the things that they're making all the movies about now and all the books about now and people jumping up and down about it now, that's when it's going to take place. But those poor saints who are quite literally losing their heads for the sake of Jesus Christ would see no comfort in their lifetime. Folks, that's a misunderstanding, a severe misunderstanding of God's book. It was about to happen. These folks were about to see the signs that we're about to study here. I want to spend just a moment on this because it's very crucial, really, to all the Bible. But especially looking at the context of what's going on here. Rome began a persecution back in the reign of a man named Nero. A.D. 54 to about 68, he reigned. Uh, fell on his own sword, actually had a servant kill him because he couldn't face... Uh, his own people <laughs> coming against him. And nevertheless, coward, manipulator, 
killed his mother, killed his sister, killed his stepfather. You know, the, the typical Roman politician of the day. He did all these things to come to power. It started then, but it was localized. But by the time this man, man by the name of Domitian, he came on the scene in about AD 81. His, his father, Vespasian, had ruled. His brother, Titus, had ruled and great things. Built the Colosseum in Rome, if you've ever seen it. Marvel to behold. But then he comes on the scene, and he's following in daddy and big brother's footsteps, and he has his own theories. He uh, is somewhat friendly to Christianity. Matter of fact, uh, some historians believe that his wife and his daughter uh, actually were converts. Christianity, which may be what turned his heart and mind away from being friendly toward the Christian religion as they would see it. And he began to begin severe persecutions. He might have just lost his mind. I don't know. He claimed himself Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. And if you don't bow your knee to me, if you don't claim that I am deity, your life is forfeit. They'll kill you. And not humanely, by the way. The Roman Empire had learned how to kill people for centuries by this time, and they knew how to do it well. And if you don't do the things we say, we may burn you alive at the stake. Nero did a good bit of that. We may off with your head. We may throw you to wild dogs that haven't eaten in days. We may do all these horrific things. And the church of the first century was faced with this. And when they have the book of Revelation is written to these folks of the first century. And they are seeing these things. And they are seeing it firsthand. Day in and day out. Matter of fact, in chapter 2, verse 13, there's a man named Antipas. He says, my faithful servant, or literally a martyr, who was killed among you. That seems to imply to me that he might have been killed right among the church. Could have been a leader in the church, elders, elders, preachers, that sort of, those, those people, uh, men of the first century were killed first. You know, you strike off the head of the snake. But you know what they missed? The head of the church isn't on earth. I wish some folks would still realize that, you don't you? He's in heaven above. You can kill us all day long. But it's not going to make a difference to the head. And it's really not going to make that big a difference to the body. You know the church grew during this time? Can you believe that? They grew. That's what we need, a persecution. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, by the way. Though we are still persecuted, aren't we? We're not being threatened with losing our head, but we're being threatened a lot of other ways. And the church saw this. And they were going through these things literally every day. Men were dragged out of their homes and killed in front of their families. People were dragged out of the worship services. They would come in. They, all these things were taking place. Burned down houses. Burned down buildings. Anything demanded to have built, burning all their copies of their holy scriptures. All these things to be done. Whatever it takes, let's stamp out this group that calls themselves the church. And it didn't happen. And that's what these folks are facing. That's the horrors they're facing every day empire wide not just in Rome not just in a little place here or there anywhere Rome was felt which was by the way by this time it, the Roman Empire was broad it covered a vast territory and where Christians met they were met with this sort of thing is wide they were under duress now think about this I love this part in the midst of all these we have beatitudes blessings right you think about Jesus and the beatitudes back in Matthew 5 through 7 especially Matthew chapter 5 but these beatitudes stick out to me a lot in this book blessed is he literally he that reads aloud there in verse 3 they would have public readers of scripture they didn't have copies of the Bible like we do and the letters would be circulated around the congregations and someone would read those in public. But listen, it is a dual blessing. He that reads aloud and those that hear. That's all of us. The reader and the ones hearing. 
There is a beatitude upon these folks because of what they're hearing. They're being blessed for it. Why would I be blessed in this setting or any setting, but especially this setting? Because I'm hearing the signs that are being given. I'm understanding these things are about to come to pass. And once I get through and finish what was known as the, 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 this letter to the seven churches of Asia, once I finish this, you know what I see? God is going to help me win. No matter what Rome does, no matter how many swords they pull, no matter how many headman's axe may swing, and how many pyres burn with the bodies of Christians, God wins. I'm going to give you a cheat sheet right now. Then the book says we win. Don't you hate it when somebody spoil gives you a spoiler alert, right? They ruin that for you. We win. Because God says so. Because God makes it so. He doesn't just say so. He makes it so. Thus, there's a blessing upon the reader and upon the hearer. And look at verse, chapter 14, verse 13. Blessed are you, die in the Lord from henceforth. Why, says the Spirit? They shall rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. There's a blessing for dying in Jesus. They've stood the test. They've stood strong. We look at chapter 6 some in a couple of weeks or so. We'll look at some of those folks there that were under the altar crying out. But they were already blessed because they left this world behind and all those hardships they were seeing, they were being blessed for it. Or how about this one? Blessed are those who watch. In context there in chapter 16, blessed are those who watch for the coming of Jesus Christ. There's an expectation for Christians. Sometimes not living in horrible situations like they are, maybe we don't look and watch as much as we should. Maybe we lose that expectation. I don't know. But one thing I do know, there's a blessing. My, why is there a blessing in watching? Because he's going to come. There's a blessing. It's not just the watching. It's knowing what's coming. It's that expectation. Blessed are those who are called, he says in chapter 19 and verse 19. We have another beatitude upon us because we're called to be Christians, because we're called out of the world. We're called, as Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, out of darkness into his marvelous light. And since we're called from darkness into his light, we are blessed. Now keep in mind the context, right? Isn't it nice to know that we're blessed by God during even the most trying times? That God's still putting that blessing upon us? That He's still giving us the things that we need? That He's helping us along? Because He says, blessed and holy. The idea here of sanctified, really, are those of the first resurrection. I believe in the context, we're looking at those the Christians. We are resurrected. We were, when we are born again, according to Romans chapter 6, there's a man of sin put to death but we are raised to walk in what newness of life folks that's a new birth and you know what that is that's a resurrection I was dead but I'm alive what did the prodigal say mm -hmm. dead but alive spiritually dead spiritually alive there's our resurrection there in chapter 20 and verse 6. There's the, the reason we're blessed because of that because he's about to recount about those folks who didn't take part of the first resurrection. And their part, according to verse 10, is a lake of fire and brimstone which burns forever. Thus we have a blessing because of that. We're missing out on the hell that was reserved for the devil and his angels. Blessed are those who keep the words. Notice the emphasis, the emphasis here on the words that are being read, that are being practiced. From the beginning verses until almost the very end of verses. It's there. We'll see a lot in the seven churches of Asia too. And think about this. Blessed are those who wash their robes. We're going to see some about colors used in this book in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to leave you in suspense. I'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're going to look at the colors used in here. But we've washed our robes. The picture there is pure. Spiritually pure. And we're blessed because of it. Because of what we've done. The Beatitudes, these, you know, we don't think about this a lot in Revelation. We think about, what did that one horse mean when he came riding over? What was that death? What happened? What is the thousand year reign? What's that pit? What about those locusts that look like horses and heads of men and, women and women's hair? And all those things. I don't know. You'll have to tell me what all that means. But I know this. I know what the book teaches, right? And we'll talk about that. But we've got all these blessings that come to us. And let's think about this for a moment. 
here is something that comes out very strongly in the book and it's judgment and against Rome and it's against the devil uh, and I said all against Rome and the devil um, it's not really a judgment I guess but in chapter 10 when we get there about the church or the temple he records it there to measure up take a read and measure up the temple uh, and we'll talk about those things when we get there but nevertheless all these judgments of God though are not against the church but they're against Rome the Roman Empire was per punishing the church severely at that time. They need some help. They need some relief. They need a breath of fresh air. What better way to get a breath of fresh air than from God Almighty? To <laughs> breathe in the things He has given us. To hear me bless for these words. To keep these words. To wash our robes. And to know what the words teach us. That we're still blessed even in death. If not more so. Because God gives it to us. When these judgments came down. Let's think about this for a moment. And I want to give a little bit of a short Bible history here. Egypt, Exodus chapter 6 and, the, and chapters following, through 12 and others really. But God brought down his judgment against the Egyptian empire. Mighty as there was in the day, I can assure you. Far, Assyria hadn't come up yet. Chaldea, Babylon hasn't come up yet. Other nations around, Akkadians and those folks, they were still peddling around. Egypt was a wonder to behold. And they had God's people. God says, let them go. The time has come. I don't want them in there any longer. He gave them ten chances. My goodness, isn't that enough? And it took the tenth to convince him, and that didn't work, right? They still chased them all the way to the Red Sea. God's judgment came down. Why? His people cried out to him. They served with rigor, Exodus 1 and verse 11. They were hurting. They were in pain. They had, when you get to the book of Ezekiel, we find out they had already started worshiping idols in that place. God says it's time to get out and get you straight. Time has come. And they served for no other reason than because they were large in number. That's it. That's it. When you leave uh, Egyptian uh, captivity, I think about Assyrian captivity. The Assyrians took away the northern kingdom. The kingdom of Israel had split by this time. They took away the northern kingdom in the early 720s B.C. Took them away, hauled them off to Assyria, sent back some folks into Samaria, had all the Samaritan race began from that, the Samaritan people began from that, a mixed up, muddled up religion. And they're gone. Until this southern kingdom down just below them that used to be the main power, Chaldea, Chaldeans, you'll see, Babylonians, we know them better as. Babylon was the capital, actually. But in this land of Chaldea, they take away the southern kingdom. Jeremiah commits to the, 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 the next to last and the, and the next, to la next to next to last chapter of that book, 50 and 51, long chapters to God's wrath and vengeance upon the Babylonian people. After Jeremiah had the weeping prophet, right? Had gone through so much to try to save those people from captivity, trying to get them out of, of, of the place where they were and get them right in God's sight again. God says, look, they're gonna, I'm going to use them to punish you, but you know what's going to take place? They will diminish because God says so. When you look at even his own people, these last two here, Israel and Judah, Israel said a moment ago was taken away by the Syrians, by, uh, Judah by the Babylonians or the Chaldeans. God used them, but God says, look, you're not going to stay there. The, let the message to the seven churches of Asia and to the church of the first century and to the church of the 21st century, God cares. God knows. He feels. He wants to bring you out of these places. He doesn't want you to stay where you are. He doesn't want the persecution to happen. But listen, things happen. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to bad people. But you know what about being good people? God's on our side. He's looking. He's helping. He's bringing us through. And let's think about this one thing for just a moment. And I'm not advertising shoes, by the way. Give me just a moment. The word we know on a swoosh, right? Shoes, of course, now it's on headbands and athletic wear and you name it, everywhere else you see. Uh, it comes right out of the Greek language. The noun, nike, is how they would say it. N-I-K-E, if you brought it over into the English, is the noun form. Nikao would be the verb form of it. And you'll see it 17 times in Revelation. Overcoming, 
overcomes victory, often in the book, all but about two times, and two times it refers to the beast, the false prophet, having a victory. But you know what it is? Extremely short-lived because the saints of God overcome him by way of he who rides on that great horse, Jesus Christ. He who has the double-edged sword that protrudes out of his mouth. He overcomes all the things that they were seeing, all the wickedness of the, of the Roman Empire. They are about to fall. The Roman Empire fell. The Western Empire fell anyway. The, the larger portion of the Roman Empire. They fell. Church, listen to me very closely. They fell because of the church. The church never raised a sword, nor an axe, nor a ballista, <laughs> nor any other weapon of war or shield or helmet or anything else against them of man's devices. Yet they won the great battle against the greatest empire the world had ever seen and maybe has, will ever see. They never raised a finger. But here's a question. It's kind of tricky, so bear with me. Did they put on armor and take up a weapon? You can answer yes, it's okay. I don't like people to fail my test, so I like to give you the answers, right? Ephesians 6.10 says we take up armor. Don't we have a helmet of salvation? Have a breastplate of righteousness, right? Our feet are shod with the gospel of peace. And we should take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. They won because they donned God's battle armor, took up His weapon of choice. If we were, were to raise up a, a little army with all of our modern warfare, all the things we have, and to go out there and try to shoot them up all the world, you talk about a bloodbath. And the church goes down and down and down. Victory comes of he, as that a moment ago in chapter 1, verse 18, who was dead but is alive forevermore, has that sharp two-edged sword protruding out of his mouth, who stands valiantly upon that horse and rides to battle and slays folks left and right, not a foe can stand against him, ever. And we follow him into battle church we win guaranteed I guarantee it this morning if not I'll give you all your money back you paid to get in this morning I will I will give you I'll refund your admission price I promise because we're going to win church the book of Revelation is a wonderful book and we're going to look at the next few weeks and have some better understanding of it and look at those glorious things will there be some wild adventurous scenes at times you bet but I'm telling you we come out on top every time no matter what. If you are here this morning though, church, and you have never obeyed the gospel, if you ever never done what I mentioned a moment ago in Romans chapter 6, if you as, as is worded in, in our text this morning, never washed your robes, have never washed those sins away by the water of grave of baptism, the Bible says you can do it. And we encourage you to do so. We want you to do so. Because God said so. Because Jesus Christ, that great I am, he talks about, remember he is in the book of Revelation, the Alpha, that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And the omega, that's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Sometimes it's just translated the first and the last. And forevermore. He commands it, desires it. He made the way. The blood with which we're washed is Jesus' blood, not ours. It's not the blood of the martyrs of the first century or any century thereafter. But it's the only blood that can atone for our sins. Maybe you've done that, but you've fallen away. Listen, the Bible says in 1 John 1 and verse 7 that that blood still cleanses us. It makes us pure from whatever we may have done outside of God's realm of law. It makes us right again. And thanks be to God for it. He's made that way. If you have a need today, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing.